So this is being recorded. Welcome. This is uh, Monday afternoon, March 30th. This is the Economics of Square Dancing and Calling at the 42nd Annual Caller Lab Convention. My name is Eric Hennerlaw, and my panelist here is Paul Henze. Thank you for attending. This session is being recorded, so we ask that if you have any comments or anything to say, that you state your name, where you're from, and then make your comments on the microphone. Use a microphone. Um, it's important because many callers will listen to this session in the future and they want to hear everybody's comments. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, this is the first time we've had a session like this, and we've never really discussed uh, economics and square dancing before. In life, there are many things that are taboo. We don't talk oftentimes in personal life about politics, religion, and money. Those are the three things you don't usually talk about at the dinner table when you have friends over, right? You don't talk about how much money you made or you know, your political or religious beliefs. Um, so, so this is kind of one of those kind of touchy areas when you talk about the economics of square dancing, right? Like, you know, well, we really shouldn't think about that because it's, it's really just a fun activity, right? There's no economics here. We're not talking about money. I mean, you know, and maybe it's not right that there should be any money. Maybe it should be free for everybody, right? There's, there's a thought process along that line. Several years ago, there was an email that was sent out in our area by a square dancer in, uh, in, in the near, nearby area who was discouraged about the... Uh, decline of clubs and, and her solution and she put this big email out was it time for the callers to stop charging money they should just call for free to give back to the activity and of course that you know in her mind that would reverse the trend that all of a sudden there would be plenty of square dancers so in her mind all you had to do is make the activity free not pay the callers and we'd have plenty of dancers now I didn't necessarily subscribe to that thought I didn't, <laughs> didn't you know that was that was her opinion her thought on that thing I was like mm, I'm not so sure about that so what we want to talk about here, and we have a small group, that's great. So I really, you know, if you all can participate, that would be really handy because I think we can get some good ideas and get them on the tape here. <clears throat> um, is we want to discuss the economic issues facing square dancing and talk about ways we can, you know, explore different solutions to that. Um, <clears throat> there are many economic issues for square dancing. You know, there are, there are the economic issues. How much does it cost to rent a hall? How much does it cost to do advertising? How much does it cost to pay a caller? Um, all the things that go, how much does it cost for the supplies for the hall, all of that, how do you keep it going? There's a lot of economics and square dancing. We like to think we can do it all out of the goodness of our heart. Unless we are, you know, self-made millionaires, we can't do that. We have to figure out a way to make this thing happen. So uh, that's what we want to kind of talk about a little bit here, and uh, perhaps we can get some more people involved, as you know, not only you, but get a larger audience involved through the, through the recording and, and our discussions with other people. Um, so, so here's a question, and this, this is really a big question for a lot of people. When you think of square dancing, you're all callers. Do you consider square dancing a hobby or a business? Now think about that for a second, because different callers have a different opinion about this. I've run into a lot of callers who believe that square dancing for them is a hobby. It's just something they do in their spare time, because of course they have a real job doing something else, right? And so they do square dancing calling as a hobby. And so if they make some money, if they make a few bucks, that's great. If they make a few more bucks, that's great. If they don't make much, that's okay too. And they have expenses, but that's okay, because it's really a hobby. They don't really care. They don't care if they come out in the black or in the red or whatever. It's just a hobby. So... The first question to ask yourself is, do you consider square dance calling a hobby or a business? A hobby that pays. Hobby that pays. Yeah. And, and, of course, we know from an IRS standpoint how, how the IRS views a hobby, right? The IRS says it's a hobby if you don't make a profit in at least two of the five years. Two of the five years. You've got to make a profit in at least two of the last five years. Otherwise, they'll consider it a hobby. And, of course, disallow all your losses. So... You know, for some of us, it might be a hobby. And for those for those people, this, this, this session isn't really addressed to those who just have a very casual, relaxed attitude about it um, being a hobby. I'm really addressing it to those who consider it more of a business because even though this is not my primary income, it's a part of my income, it's, it's a real part of my income, and I have to consider that along with everything else, my day job and everything else, and it's a business. So that, you know, I've got income from groups, I've got expenses that go out to support calling, and, and in the end, I... I want to come out in the black, and I want to come out in the black so much, you know, so I can you know, add into my income, right? So, um, so, so given that as kind of a background, I just want to talk about it a little bit. So have you ever talked to any callers that thought of calling as a hobby, that just don't take it seriously? They take it as, like, pocket change they might pick up? Have you ever talked to anybody like that? Have you ever seen anyone like that? I, I have talked to some. They just, you know, they do it once in a while. They'll, they'll call once every six months or something. And so they really is a hobby for them. They just, you know, they 
have some old equipment, they might pull it out for something. But the one who's a business, the caller who's calling on a regular basis, perhaps every week or more, more often than once a week, you know, that caller, it's a business because they're going out and doing it on a regular basis. They're, they're charging a fee or they're getting a fee from the dancers, and they expect in the end to be rewarded for their services, right? Um, so so you're really thinking along those lines. You're doing a business. You're doing a business just like any other business, like Dunkin' Donuts sells donuts and like like, uh, you know, Applebee's sells burgers and whatever it might be. You're a business selling Square Dance Calling just as they are the consumers who are buying it every time they come to your dance and pay a fee. So those are my opening remarks. Before we go further on, Paul, do you want to add anything into that? Uh, one thing you got to realize is that this day and time, uh, the regulations are getting to be more and more extreme on your situations and when you're doing something. And I have been audited before by Uncle Sam. And the auditing, uh, I use a CPA. Do, does everyone in here that does anything at all with your putting figures together, do you use a CPA, especially including your, your square dance stuff? If you do not, I would strongly suggest you do so. When I went into this IRS interview, I had the CPA go with me. And he asked me a whole lot of questions. And if he came in with this intent, he had an 8 and a half by 14 uh, pad, a pencil, folded his arms, and you're guilty. That's the, that's the thought that you get it in that situation. So I'm encouraging you think logically in terms of all your expenses when you put things down and know that that's what you're looking at is if you ever had an audited situation going on, that's what would happen to you. I don't care if they say their, their percentages are low right now. They're really going to check you. Second thing is, I'm from Tennessee, and we're very close to Nashville, and Nashville has a lot of the recording industry and the people. They are now going out and taking teenagers, well, I shouldn't say teenagers, taking uh, kids in college, and they're having these kids in college indiscreetly come walking into the back of your things and dance, and you're thinking this might be a person looking out to see if you're going to be a new dancer with them. Some of these people are listening and, and asking one or two questions. Number one, does the club have certificates or something that's going to show that your caller is AS, ASCAP, BMI certified? Do they also have something that's going to prove some liability? And thirdly, can you prove your profitability or non-profitability situation as your club organizes and runs? Just food for thought as we're talking here. Yeah, that's, that's good. That, these are things people are asking for when you're trying to run something out there, when you're, when you're trying to set up that group. Um, so if you're running your own group right now, so think about this for a second. If you're out there and running a group and you are thinking, well, okay, I want to produce, I want to do square dance calling. I want to be a square dance caller. I want to call square dancing for dancers out there. What are you offering the dancers? What, are you, what is the product you're offering the dancers? And in marketing terms, what they say is, what is your value proposition? What is it that you're offering them that they want to come and buy? So that's kind of a question you have to ask. There's no specific answer, but you have to ask yourself that question. What am I offering them that they want to come in the door and pay X dollars to buy that product? Hopefully on a recurring basis, like every week, right? So you've got to have something in there. So that, that's a value proposition you have. If you're offering nothing, then you should expect to get nothing. If you're offering something, then you should expect to get dancers, and hopefully they're willing to pay for it, you know, because there's a value in there. There's a value in what you're doing. If you don't have a value in what you're doing, you don't think you have a value, then don't expect to get paid for it. But you've got to figure out what your value is for doing this. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about, uh, this is where it gets fun. I really want to get your participation in this. How many of you guys do um, party nights or one-night stands? One, two, do you do them at all? Nope, you don't, don't do them, okay. Just getting back into it, okay, great. So, uh, Kenton, can you come up and share with us a little bit about party nights? How, I want to know, Kenton, how do, you, how do you structure your contract with a, for a party night um, and what you agree to do, your terms, and what fee schedule? No, no, Kenton. Or we'll give us an idea, a range, how you might negotiate it. And, and we can we can role play if you want. I'll be a group that wants to hire you. Well, I uh, do country westerns, and that's usually what. Kenton Sullivan from Missouri. I um, Generally, they, they 
they talk to me, they they contact me. I don't promote it that that I do it too much, but uh, I've got several here in Springfield I do for that. It's usually homeschool groups, and uh, they call me with what they want, and uh, I just quote them a price. Yeah. And generally around $150 for two hours. I don't know of any others in the area that do it, really. I, it's probably cheaper than the others are. But it pays better than what Square Dance Calling does, as far as that's concerned. <laughs> mm-hmm. Don, can you um, share any information about your party nights? Uh, sure, about party nights, how you might structure a contract, with uh, what kind of gigs you do, and how you might structure a contract. Don Beck, Massachusetts. How do I structure a con- Well, we I don't sign contracts. I what I do is I bite my lip because it hurts me to rip people off, and I'm a cheapskate, so I figure nobody's going to pay this much, and I say I need three hundred dollars plus travel expenses, and usually they don't flinch. <laughs> I, I don't do it very often, one or two a year. Um, because square dance clubs seem to ex- expect really we've been you know going on two dollars per person per night for many years and I, I guess we're up to six or seven and I'm not sure what clubs are charging these days but the economics are you can't really sustaining club can't go a lot but a, but an organization that's putting on a party um, you know they otherwise would be paying a band that I'm sure charges a whole pile or tar- charging a DJ that they seem to charge a lot, and they don't flinch when I say that. And, um, for me, travel expenses can be can be costly. Um, I live on an island. I don't call very much because when I moved to the island, it was impractical. It, it cost me 70, 80, 90 bucks to get off the island and back home. Um but some of the party nights I did two, three, four years ago were in Nantucket, a neighboring island. And so expenses turned out to be round trip airfare for ninety nine bucks on top of the three hundred. Plus they put me up for the night and they're willing to pay for it. I'm willing to go there. Um but I have fun and they seem to have fun too, so why not? You know. But you know, what I try to do that is explain what I need, I need a table and a place to plug my extension cord into. I don't need a band. I don't need a this or that. And I need two to three hours, their preference. You know, it takes my whole day to get there anyway. <laughs> um, and make sure they're going to have sufficient number of people. And hopefully it's something where peop- they dedicate a piece of time that people go and dance for those two hours, not that people come and go during that three hours or show up later and I have to teach circle left yet again. Um, But no written contract, but just an understanding with the guy, the person that's running it. And sometimes it works out and sometimes we just play a lot of music as people wander in and out. (laughs) I know how that goes. I know how that goes. I... I did a party night. Um, I do prefer a number of party nights. One night, st- we call st- we call them one night stands or party nights. And I do. I many years ago, I did come up with a written contract. I wrote myself a one page contract that I send out. And this is what I do, whatever. So it's, we're clear about it. Um, I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, so uh, my rate's between four and six hundred dollars to do an evening, and that's what we get. And that's somewhere in anywhere in the Bay Area, depending on what kind of event it might be. If it's if it's a wedding, I've gotten as much as seven hundred dollars. Uh, but I won't do it for less than four hundred dollars. Um, but, th- but that's what the economics are in our area that that they that support that kind of thing. So with other areas, you know, if I was in a less metropolitan area, then it might not support that kind of that kind of fee there. Um, do you do party nights, Paul? I do about two a night or two a night, two two a month. <laughs> and um, you got to understand, in our area is a is a very big country western because we're in the Tennessee, and the music industry is from that area. 
the things that we have to involve ourselves with is not just line dancing in squares, but we also have to teach two-step and, and um, uh, teach the waltz and some other things that go along with the country music atmosphere. I found, and I'll ask, first of all, what's your budget? And they'll generally say, well, we would have, a, we had a DJ last year, and we paid him 750 is that okay? And I'll pause a little bit and say, that sounds good to me, and we'll go with that. Yeah, and what the budget does is it, it gives them a starting point, and sometimes they'll say, well, is there anything else? Well, yes, sir, I'm driving from Chattanooga up to there, and I'm coming back, or else I'm going to stay overnight. And they say, well, okay, we'll arrange transportation, 40 bucks if, uh, you know, one way and 40 bucks back or whatever it happens to be. And a lot of them will volunteer, just like Don said, they'll give you a place to stay overnight, which is great to have also. Um, you got to realize that when these people are booking you, uh, they might come back and say, well, what do you think we should charge the people that are coming in that are going to be there that night? And I said, well, tell me approximately how many people that you're going to have attending. Well, we had last year we had 100. And, now, this is a group that might have had a um, something else besides square dancing last year. They said, well, last year we had 150. The year before we had 175. And I says, what did you charge for that at that time? He said, well, we charge a dollar and a half, $2 a person. And I says, I would not put and have you charged anything less than four per person. Well, all of a sudden in their mind, this justifies the payment that they're going to make to you, but it also puts some coins in their bucket too because now they don't have to just exist. They can also have some money to spread their costs on. And that's pretty important. You've got to volunteer and be back and forth with these people because they're looking for ideas as well as you giving these, these thoughts to them. So, um, so let's say, let's, let's change tax for a second. Let's say, let's say you're going to go out and start a, start a new group, a new class. You're going to do a new class. You're going to do a party night or a one night stand or a new club or whatever it might be on your own. This kind of dovetails in with my last session I did on being a rainmaker and creating something on your own, making something happen, right? You got to go out and find a hall and you got to, you got to, or some place to dance like that. So what are the economics in doing that? Let's think about that for a second. You got to go out and find a hall to dance in, some place to dance. Where do you do that? How do you do that? What are some suggestions? Where, where are the places you can think of to go dance? We dance in, a so, in the hall of a, called the Marin Rod and Gun Club. So it's a, it's a hunting and fishing organization. Really, it's a bar um, and they have a lot of drinkers, but whatever. It's, it, but they have this big hall that we rent out and we dance in that. But usual places you go out into rental hall, where are the usual places? Schools, churches, synagogues, senior centers, community centers, Usual places, right? Um, city halls or city, well, city community centers. Many of them have specific requirements that you have to have. Insurance, like I say, you already got the insurance down because you're, you've got that from Color Lab, which is a nice thing. Um, but what kind of rents are you going to pay? I mean, rents are usually, you know, connected with the size of the facility, where the facility is located, what kind of features it might have. So you got to think about that. So you think, okay, I can get this place for. Twenty-five dollars an hour. Well, if I need it for three hours, it's seventy-five dollars. That doesn't sound too bad, actually. You know, from where I where I live, that seventy-five dollars sounds pretty good. You know, um, if it's seventy-five dollars an hour on a Wednesday night every week, that's going to be a different equation because that's two hundred twenty-five dollars for three hours, right? So, so one of those things you get to factor in there is what is it going to cost for that venue? What's it going to cost for that hall there? What is it going to cost to advertise? Um, if you're putting something on yourself, what are the economics of advertising? This is the thing that gets me. Um, well, let's go back to the halls for a second. If you're running your own show, you, you know what we just discussed, where you have to pay for the hall. Clubs rent the halls. If you work for a club, they're going to rent the hall space, or they're going to get it somehow. Tech Squares gets it for free, for instance, because they're part of the university. Another club might have to rent a church space or rent you know, a, a community center or whatever it might be, or a school space. So they're very sensitive to the cost of that hall rental. But again, it sort of seems like inflation never catches up with the square dancers. You know, they're paying 50 bucks a night for that school from 1982, and now it's 2015, and the school wants to raise it to $65 a night, and they're getting very upset, right? 
30 years have gone by, and, and inflation hasn't really caught up. Now the school is going to raise the price on them, and the square dancers are throwing their hands up saying, oh, we can't afford that. It's $65 an hour now. So there's sort of a mindset that sets in. I kind of see this with square dancers. I call it kind of like a frozen economic mindset that, that the prices should never go up over time. The school is still there, right? It hasn't changed at all. Um, but why is the price going up? It hasn't gone up equally, you know, like the price of milk. So do you want to answer me that? Yeah. Um, I'm going to kind of give you a reverse thought pattern. I got into this because our kids at one time were playing soccer, and we could not get a football field to use because the football coach would not let us use the field. Does that sound familiar with politics? And I went. I happened to know the head commissioner that I sold, and I went to him and I told Fred what was the what what was going on, and he says, "Who told you that?" And I said, "I won't mention any names, but we need this and this field." Well, I kind of told who the name of the coach was, but I still let went him. He went to that coach. I had a phone call, and no less than thirty minutes later, Paul come back down here. We can work, make some arrangements. If you'll go to your politicians and let them know that this is a senior citizen and it's not Dominus Go Friscum, okay, and you let these politicians know this, that's what that money was given for. Intentionally, is for us to use that or the community to use these things. And if they've got a young buck in there that's the new leader of this uh, thing, he's trying to make big bucks for the center and make it look good, that's not the purpose. The purpose is, is for people like us in the community to come back and use it. So go to your politicians from time to time and let them know you voted to put these guys in. I'm reversing this here, but that's use where you can. Yeah, That's excellent. That is so true. Negotiate. Don't ever be afraid to negotiate. I'm not saying don't expect prices not to go up, but don't, don't, don't just take it at face value. Sometimes we look at halls and they're $150 an hour. Well, we can't do that. But then if you talk to them and negotiate for a minute and you find out, well, wait a second. Oh, you're only using, oh, you're doing it every week on Tuesdays just from 6.30 to 8.30 and in the side room? Well, that's only $25 an hour. We can do that. Or, you know, they can figure out something along that line. Oh, you're a nonprofit? We can do that too, you know, so that you get the nonprofit rate. Don? Two quick things. One is that if you're starting a new group like you can say, it's a gamble. Can I afford this $50 for tonight? because there are only three people going to show up or three squares. And, and that's something you have to wonder about. But one example, and this was many years ago, I had a club, and we were paying a certain amount for the cafeteria in a school. In a school. And all of a sudden they said, after a year or two, the price is going up. And we thought, that's close to break even. But, you know, one of the members of the club was a member of the town that we were in and I think had connections with the school and knew some of the policies and said, let me let me check around. And then they came back and said, you know, I, I found out that they have different rates for different groups. And since we're adult education, and I convinced them of that, our rate's going down instead of up. It was adult education, and that got us through a different door. So be aware of that. Check. Check to see which box you fit into and talk to your politicians. I like both those ideas. So write that down. It's a good one. <laughs> all right, so that's a hall, hall rent. You know, you've got to find a hall and all that. A lot of stuff going on. A lot of people to talk to. A lot of ways to talk to people about what you're doing, too. We're a nonprofit activity, notwithstanding the fact if you're a caller-run organization doing a caller thing, yes, but maybe you, I would look at it in the sense of getting a group together to form it as a club, at least some kind of a you know, club association. You know, And you're a 501c7 at that point, which is a club association. Not a, it's a not-for-profit, but not a charitable organization. Um, advertising. Hey, what are the economics in advertising? There's a lot of free advertising out there, right? Name five free advertising things. Christopher. Craigslist. Craigslist. That's, that's... Okay, I don't know. Vir <laughs> huh? What's that? Build your own website. Number two. Vir Virgia? Virgia? Community newspaper, all right. Don. Bulletin board. Kenton. Community calendar and the radio. Call up in the newspaper and have an article written about you. Yes, that's a great one. There's a lot of great free advertising available out there. Craigslist is a good one, by the way. Um, we've had great success in our area by using the newspaper, getting the right point. Last time they wrote an article about us, they flooded in. We had a flood of new dancers. We had to turn them away at the door. It was so many. 
No, I'm not. We didn't have to turn them away. But, <laughs> but we did have a lot of new dancers come in the door. It was so great. Um, we know we can't get an article written every time. You know, you know, we wish we could, but we can't do that. But we figured out where we can buy some advertising. We're going to buy advertising probably for the fall class. Spend about $1,000 on advertising because they get a package. They get this package in the newspaper where you do like six or eight weeks of the same ad running through a pretty big chunk. And, and it's going to be run for a whole month ahead of class. It's going to cost about $1,000. And it includes like 25,000 online impressions in their online version of the newspaper. It'll be like one of those ads on there. So all this stuff happens for about $1,000. Like, you know, that sounds like a pretty good deal. Because most of our dancers came in from the newspaper. They saw the newspaper. Like it, it was 75% of them came in that way. So we're going to find out ways to exploit that advertising and not be afraid to spend money on that because that's what it costs. It costs money to advertise. Um, you get a website. Newspapers, other collateral advertising might be what? Trifolds, flyers. People don't do flyers as much anymore. You notice that? Because no business wants to take a flyer and stick it on the window like they used to. Our club last time had four by six postcards. Beautiful color postcards done in Vistaprint. You go online to Vistaprint, you create the whole thing, all the information. We threw some photos on there, made it look fun, really cool. Everything about the club got 500 printed for $71, and they're shipped to us. And we took these beautiful, glossy postcards. Businesses will take those. You can put a stack of postcards there on the counter by the register, and they'll take that. They're not going to take flyers, but they'll take those things, and people will grab them because they're glossy postcards. They look nice. So there's different ways of doing advertising that are not very high cost, but some do cost money, and don't be afraid to spend the money on that. If you have a website, make sure your website looks decent. It doesn't look like it's broken down. There's nothing worse than a broken down website. Use Facebook. That is absolutely free. All the other social media is free. Use that as well. Um, uh, a couple things. PBS, do you have a big PBS stations in your area? They've got to give free publicity uh, from time to time, and you can get blocks of these uh, free advertisings from them and schedule it over uh, two times a week, three times a week, and get it you know, into, into the area this way at all. We had a, a, a couple of fellows in our church that had bulletin boards, not bulletin boards, but had these big boards they, they uh, had out here on the interstate. And he says, Paul, he says, I'll give you a portion of that board. And he took a portion of the, uh, he took three quarters of it, and I took a quarter, and we put a score dancing blurb up there. He was already paying for the ad. He didn't mind putting that up as a personal courtesy. It's another way that you can come back with some sort of a, a situation. We had a couple of people in our areas that prepared 8.5 by 11 flyers and went around to some of the grocery stores and said, would you mind putting one of these in each of the bags? as the people are going out, and we did, and we got maybe a 10% return off of that one. It's just thinking outside the box. You've, if you're going to spend money, that's one thing. If you don't want to spend money or can't spend money, go to somebody maybe that you think is a good spark plug and ask them, can you help me out here? Go to your, some of your colleges, and I'm saying this from experience. I'm a marketing major, and in school, we had to do a lot of research for the major professors and write their reports for them that they got all this credit for. But I learned pretty quickly that if you're going to do anything from an advertising standpoint, go to the college students. You'd be amazed at these ideas they've got. And go to a marketing professor and talk with him and just say, hey, can you get me one or two of these kids and make this, this their project for the quarter? Help me to sell square dancing or help me to do this routine. And you'll be amazed at the way the club's... Uh, can get some response that way. The next thing I, that I w would suggest is go to your phys ed departments and work with your phys ed departments and ask them to let you come in and teach a two-week cycle. And this gets the promotion in the square dancing. It's got a long time coming because you're working with these new educators in college level that are going to be on the platforms later or they're going to be out there in the communities teaching things to senior citizens, to advertising groups or whatever, but use those people f to become advertising for you too. And promise these people that if you'll, when you get into school, if you'll teach square dancing, I'll come in and I'll do a free dance with you and the kids. If you'll bring moms and dads in and you've got to have one couple in each of the squares. So mom and dad has got to come in with their kids in that square, and mom and dad will see square dancing at its best and not as in the old days it was taught, advertising. Yeah, it's got to be seen that way. Um, insurance, because that's part of economics, right? You've got stuff. You've got, you've got your equipment. 
And, of course, every hall that you rent to wants to make sure you're insured for general liability. So if somebody gets hurt, that your insurance is primary and they won't sue the hall. They want to make sure that whoever gets hurt will sue you first before they sue the hall, the, the, the sponsor, the, the owner of the venue. Um, oftentimes, the halls want to be named additionally insured. Luckily, you're members of Caller Lab. You've got that built in. That is such a blessing. You have no idea. It is such a blessing. Um, because Caller Lab provides million-dollar insurance through your membership, you can get a certificate of insurance from the Caller Lab uh, insurance provider um, and get your hall named additionally insured free. And they do this pretty quick, like overnight, which is really, really nice. So that's a great part of this thing. That's the liability part. That works for you. It covers you. By the way, it covers you. It doesn't cover your club, but it covers you. So if you're running a caller run workshop, it's going to cover you doing your adventure. Uh, if a club is there, the club will have to have its own insurance. I have in times when the, when the, when the club hasn't been able to get their insurance because the, the, for some reason the, the, the mechanisms for clubs to get their insurance certificates is a lot more cumbersome than Caller Lab. Um, I have provided insurance certificates for a club that's running one dance or something like that. So I will take on that liability. So the liability part, really, that coverage is, is available from Caller Lab. That's a real blessing. Keep that in mind. You can get that anytime. It's built into your dues. The other side of the insurance is the property insurance, your, your personal property, which is, of course, your calling equipment. Now, we know an MA220 these days is, what, $1,500, right? Your speakers, your cables, all that stuff, you're into just $2,000 or more easily. Um, you can do two things. You can self-insure, which is another way of saying don't have insurance, and if anything happens to it, you will just take care of it yourself. Or you can insure it. And when you insure it, typically it's done as an all-risk basis, which means anything that happens to it, it's going to be covered no matter what. And it's been a while since I looked at the rates on that, but I think it's about 3%, so about $3 per 100. So if you got $2,000 worth of equipment, that's about, what, $60 a year? Is that right? Am I math right on that one? Yeah. Yeah, about $60 a year for $2,000 worth of equipment. So um, that's up to you. That's your choice. So, but those are two important economic considerations, whether or not you can afford to replace your equipment or components of your equipment out of pocket or whether you want to insure it. And your liability insurance is already built in from Caller Lab. Do you have a comment on that? Just quickly, for what it's worth, I've never been asked to provide anything that hasn't been called. Okay, so Don has never been asked if he's had insurance. I have for the halls I've rented for my workshops. They have all asked for insurance. So I've had to provide insurance for them. Um, again, not a problem, which is nice. And in a pinch, I've actually provided it for my club when they did their anniversary dance, and the Dancers Association could not come through with their insurance certificate. Um, but those are two important things to think about. So like I said, one is built in, you got it automatically. The other one is your discretion on that. Do you have anything else on insurance? Only thing on insurance that uh, you could go the uh, add, added extra cost. The My wife also uh, attends with me, and she does the line dancing part of it, which involves she wants a, a, a head mic, and she wants all that equipment that goes along with that. So you're adding up more and more things. And if you've got spare equipment that you're carrying around for whatever it needs to be, if you put it in the back of your trunk, your car insurance won't cover that. You've got to have separate insurance for everything, so don't think that can be covered that way. Uh, I've got, believe it or not, almost eight to $9,000 that I write under insurance, and my premium runs about $200 a year. But are you, are, is everyone here taking square dancing as a second income? Second income. Or if you are, remember, this is an expense that you can take off your income tax, and that's why with the CPA, Use them creatively or hurt creatively because these are expenses that, yeah, it sounds like you're paying it, but you're getting it back. Make sense? Okay. So your income, but you got an expense too. Yeah. All of this is an expense because it's part of your business. You're a Schedule C on your tax return, and your insurance expense, all these things come off as an expense against your income so it reduces your net income at the end. Um, so keep that in mind. So it's always there. Um, uh, we got, you got your equipment. you got your AMP which we, we already know that Square Dance calling equipment is not inexpensive. So it, that's, that's up there. You get your microphone, speakers, your cables and accessories, laptop. Laptop. Personal story. I did a party night, as I said, two nights ago. And um, in the process of unloading my equipment, I stacked it by the side of the driveway, brought down my speakers, came back up to watch the limo driver run over the rest of my equipment, including my laptop.
So uh, I, 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 half an hour I just got just half an hour ago I just got off the phone with the uh, organizer of that event settling that claim. They will they will pay me for my monthly laptop. Um, but that stuff adds up. I, these, I'm not sure she knows how much it's going to cost, but it's going to be a lot of money. I'm not. I'm just replacing exactly what I had too. So um, it was there. Um, so it all adds up. So keep that in mind. Like I say, you have thousands of dollars of you know, equipment you're reinsuring there. So keep that in mind what you have, so that you don't find yourself all of a sudden out of business because your microphone broke. You know, and you need to do something with that. How much do you spend on square dance music? Um, there's music out there. You get music out there. You can buy music from the music producers from anywhere from six dollars to nine dollars per tune. Some of you think, some of you collectively all think, that's pretty expensive. Well, yes and no. Compared to a ninety-nine cent Amazon or iTunes, that's expensive. But it's all a matter of economics and scale. How many iTunes songs are sold at ninety-nine cents for any one song? It could be tens of thousands. How many square dance songs are sold for any one song? Anybody have any idea? Do you want to venture a guess? Anyone? 100 would be a big seller. 100 would be a big seller in this market right now. Yeah, it used to be two, three, about 15,000 back in 1990 would be a big hit. 15,000 copies. Then in the early 2000s, it was two or 3,000 copies. Now it's like 100 to 200 would be a fantastic hit. We'll do the math on that. Let's say you're selling. Oh, it's way more expensive now to produce. So I'm a record producer. I work with uh, Buddy Weaver. And so at $9 a tune, and you sell 100 copies, that's $900 coming in the door. It doesn't even begin to offset the production costs. Okay, and you hope you sell 100 copies. So my point to this is we've had people say, well, hey, I can go out there and buy these songs for a buck a piece. Well, yeah, go buy the songs you want for a buck a piece, but the ones that are square dance songs you want to do singing calls to, you're going to have to spend nine bucks for it because that's the reality of what that economics is. You know, you can't, I think they should charge more. The guys that are still charging $6, I think they should get bumped up to $9 too because you need to buy the songs, you need to support the industry, and if you're only buying two songs a year and then you're copying illegally two other songs from two friends a year, you're not helping anybody in the process. You're making money doing what you're doing. You're charging a fee for your, for your services. Think about what percentage of your income you should put back into it. It's part of any business. Um, uh, any, any regular business plows back into the business a certain percentage of the revenue into advertising. A lot of companies use a number like a 3% of the gross revenue goes into advertising or marketing. Um, think about that for your own income. If you make, if you make I'll just make a number. Let's say you make $1,000 a year calling. And you spend 5% of that in getting new music. That's 50 bucks, right? So 50 bucks a year in new music is what? About, I don't know, five, six songs, six songs. So you should be buying a song every other month if you're making $1,000 a year. But about you make making more than 1000 a year. You know, it might be more, if you're making 3000 you, you can do the math from there. But think about putting money back in because you need to invest in making yourself better. And that includes getting new music all the time. You can't keep doing the same old songs because dancers realize it after a while. So part of the economics is you have to keep going back into it. Um, that doesn't mean don't get the stuff on iTunes, but it means that you do have to spend money on square dance music as well and be willing to do that. Talking about dance preparation, when you set up a dance, let's say you're doing your own dance out there, okay? You're gonna you're do your own dance, you gotta, you gotta prep the room, you gotta buy all the supplies for it. I'm some, something you're putting on yourself, right? You've got to rent the hall, give them their insurance certificate if they want it. You've gotta buy the, bring the, bring the cups and the, and the coffee or water, whatever you're providing, cookies if you want that, and set it all up. Now you got your whole dance going on. What do you charge the dancers to walk in the door? You thought about that? Okay. So, can I get any input, anybody? Christopher, you got any ideas on this thing? What would you charge the dancers to walk in the door on a dance you put together? Uh, basically, market rate. Okay. Christopher Schlitter from Cary, North Carolina. In our area, uh, the uh, Raleigh area of North Carolina, a typical special dance runs around $8 per dancer. And so... You, you can't charge much more than that. People w won't come, so it's you have to charge somewhere between seven and nine. Unless you're bringing some national caller down, you might be able to to charge ten, and you have to like really market your dance. Okay. 
Kenton Sullivan from Missouri. Uh, most of the clubs in this area are charging about six to six dollars, maybe seven dollars if they get a national caller in. Not very good. Since I've moved to Martha's Vineyard 18 years ago, I don't, there are no local clubs on the island. Try as I may, I haven't been able to start one. Um, and I don't know what the off-island people are. I don't go that, go off and check that often. Um, what c pops into mind is probably six dollars. What pops into mind is they're crazy with today's economics. You know, they're still on the six dollar or five dollar mentality. I think the local contra dancers charge ten. Um, my personal feeling, and one of the things I put in the brainstorming this morning is that in general we should charge more for classes than we do for club dances. Um, it's, it's drifting slightly from the thing, but any other thing you do, take bowling lessons, tennis lessons, cost you more than renting the tennis court and playing afterwards. It'll give the dancers a goal, geez, if we go through these lessons and pay this much, then we can dance for less. You know, and I wouldn't say drop the price of the dance. I'd say increase the price of the lessons. Um, I would personally think doing away with these free first night intro nights, people have a feeling you get what you pay for. And if they pay f and invest to come in that first time, they're getting a little bit more than just, well, we'll see what it's like. And from my experience, the amount of people you get through the door is not not a function of whether they pay the money or or it's free. I don't know how many people actually come because it's free the first night. People just, um, either they're going to come or they're not. Either you've attracted them some way or got a friend to drag them or it's not, but it's not because it's free. And I think um, I think maybe a people to get to commit to classes is you just charge them a tuition like you do for any other class they're going to. You charge them the whole up front for the course. Um, maybe you let them go for one night just paying the single time and see if it, it feels good. But if you pay for the whole course, they feel an obligation to continue to get their money's worth to come back. And if they don't, you got their money. <laughs> um, I haven't been able to put it into practice myself, so I don't know if these are going to work, but they're what my thoughts on it are. Got me on the microphone. Joseph Dye. I'm from uh, Georgia, and I got hurt with my, my eardrums burst on my job, so I had to stay away from the speakers. But while away, I got off into ballroom dancing, and I learned a lot about dancing, okay? Um, I went to this guitar shop to buy me some equipment, a DJ equipment, and me and the, the uh, DJ was talking. He's saying he's make three, four hundred dollars a night on a party. I said I must be in the wrong business. If that's all you get for, I mean that's what you get for DJing. Um, I got in the ballroom dancing, and now I'm a president of a club. The club has all types of problems, but they're growing. I didn't know that. I know that I had to have insurance as a square dance caller, but the other guys don't have insurance. You know, at least they out there taking their chances. So I said, stay with Carla Lab, keep your license, and learn more about that. this. We danced at the Knights of Columbus. They had a hall. And they danced under the Knights of Columbus license. The club didn't have a license. And I didn't know how to handle that, but I stayed the president. Now that they're tearing down the building for the Knights of Columbus, and we have to move someplace else. And every place we go, they ask for insurance. I learned, you know, tonight that maybe I can get insurance through them for call a lap, but I don't want to use my insurance. Um, they charge 12 to $14 per head. And the last dance we had, they had 170 people. And I said, how come we can't get people in the square dance and paying that kind of money and that type of turnout? But... I guess we're preaching or teaching to a different audience. So I'm here to learn more about what it is that I'm really trying to do and put together like a Don here. And I like your idea about the um, 
your contract. I would like to see a copy of your contract so I can put me together a contract for when I step out there on my own and I worry about the IRS, I want to comply with them because I say this is a hobby that pays. I want to pay taxes and I want to be able to pay for my equipment and don't be in the hole. That's my personal goal. I look at dancing, whether it's ballroom or square dancing, as a exercise for me in my old age. See, um, that's where I'm at right now. So I come back here to learn more about what it is that I'm trying to do as opposed to just out there doing something. I want to be right. Uh, so if I can get that, get that from you, I appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Joseph. That's great. That's great. Well, you raise a good point because here we're talking about the rates. So you in the ballroom dance community, it's 12 to $14 for ballroom dance, right? Yeah. Right. Uh, here they're 5 or 6 and maybe $8 and you don't know. And uh, how about you, Paul? What is it? Yeah, the ballroom dancing, too, you've only got a certain time limit, don't you? You don't have as long as we as square dancing normally exists either, do you? For like an hour and a half. An hour and a half is generally the time limit. 11.30, okay, okay, I misunderstood. Uh, we Talking about expenses only in the club standpoint, when Eric was bringing them out and just got me to thinking, we uh, we realize that, to, that if you're a collar run club or a club that is uh, voted, votes you to bring, uh, brings you in and they pay all the expenses, we got the class right away to, to learn to start sharing expenses. For instance, uh, one night you will be the social chairman, and the next night you're the social chairman, and the next night you're the social chairman. And what you do is you start bringing, having these people bring these various things, the Cokes, the, the chips, and whatever else would be. And that social chairman keeps all these activities going this way, and that way you don't have the payout if you're a caller run, or the club run, whatever. You don't have to worry about that way at all. Take an attack off of yours, Don, that you were talking about on the cost of paying it up front and the whole total charge. Let me give you a shorter version, and I heard this today at our table, and we were sitting back in the back talking about all these various ideas. And um, the idea was is that you approach the new dancers coming in and you say, if you'll stay with us six weeks, now you've got to realize square dancing people they might come first week and they're gone. But if you say, if you'll stay with me six, to seven, eight weeks at the most, we'll give you A, and then put whatever you want to in that blank. We'll give you a gas card. We'll give you a card for something that we'll give you a gift. We'll give you something. So you're getting something for something. People's psychology seems to work that way this day and time. And I thought, huh, it's a pretty good idea. It's kind of like a bribe, but it steals an idea. I'm going to go back and try it. Okay, but cost, that's how you can spread your cost around. That's a great idea. Yeah, prizes are a really great idea. I like that one too. But, but this is the kind of the core issue about what square dancers think the value is. It goes back to the value proposition. What is the value of square dancing? Um, and quite honestly, I think that there is a mentality that's kind of frozen in the 1950s about this thing. And we should all be paying 17 cents for a gallon of gas and whatever it might be. And so square dancing should be inexpensive. Um, it doesn't keep up with movie prices. What is what is the movie price where you are, Christopher? I don't know you, movies, I think it's 10? What is it where you are, Paul? A movie. Go to a movie. On the seven half, seven fifty. Seven fifty? No idea. No idea? No idea? Okay, nobody goes to a movie anymore. Uh, it's eleven fifty where we are for a movie. Um <laughs> cheaper price for seniors, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no. So so if a movie in our area is eleven fifty, but our, our dance price, you go to a Saturday night dance in our area, it's ten dollars per person. That's the price. That's the rate. Unless it's a two collar dance, that's fifteen dollars a person. So they move it that direction. And um where, but where they haven't moved it is in the festivals, the weekend festivals. They're still running in California. They're still running forty to fifty dollars per person for the weekend. And if you think about that, that's my daughter does West Coast swing dancing, and she goes to a West Coast swing dance weekend in this near, like an, in a hotel near San Francisco, and it's one hundred twenty-five dollars per person for the weekend. If she wants to compete, that's additional money. 
that's just to go dance for $125 for the weekend. So I start thinking about that. Again, I'm in the wrong business. <laughs> it's like, man, I should be doing the West Coast swing dancing with her. So um, there, you raise a psychological issue. There's this, this thing about free. How many times have you seen beginner class flyers that say, free, 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 come squirt dancing, free, free, free. If money was the only barrier that stopped people from square dancing, they'd be knocking down the doors to come in here because it's free. That is, not the, that is not the issue. In fact, I think it works the reverse because I think that you keep saying it's free, there's no value in there. There's no value in this thing. And yet people are still willing to, maybe not you, but most people are still willing to pay $10 to go to that movie, the movie theater, you know. So they'll pay somebody to go square dancing, whatever it might be. I don't think the free is getting us anywhere. I think even the intro nights have to have some charge, even if it's not. You put the price, you know, it's a $10 thing for the charge, and, you know, we'll have refreshments, you know, like that, whatever it might be, and people bring refreshments. Um, I'm going to give you a case study. Roseburg, Oregon is a little town 135 miles north of the California border on I-5. I went up there to do a dance. I go up there every year to do a dance for them. I live in San Francisco. Well, a couple years ago, they ran a beginner class. Now, they own their own hall. It's a rural area. They own their own square dance hall. How cool is that, right? How great. So they, their overhead is pretty low. They run a square dance class in September, and they're running it and teaching the beginners, and they charge them zero for lessons. In the end, they want them to join the club, right? So they're doing this. Six months go by, and they're charging them zero. They've now completed whatever they completed, mainstream or something, joined the club, and now they got to pay whatever it is, two fifty per person per week. And they all went away, all of them. At that point, they, wait, it's been free the whole time. Now you're asking me to pay? No, forget that. They all left. It was, it was like, and so we talked about that. I said, well, next time you start a class, why don't you just charge money up front? They did. They had a class. People came anyway. They didn't mind paying. They only charged two fifty a person. But they stayed through the end, and they graduated, and they kept going on. There was value. There wasn't this, like, give it away free, and then you're going to charge me money now? We, but you gave this away free before, you know? So it was a very, very telling story about giving things away for free. Um, you, you can't do that. You have to bring it up there. And the value has to be there. The biggest resistance you're going to get, of course, is with existing score dancers who've been dancing 20, 30, 40 years. It says, you know what? I've been paying $5 a night forever, and I just think that $10 is way too much. Not going to work for me, you know? You might lose that dancer. On the other hand, the new dancers that are coming in the door, they don't know any better. They'll pay the $10 or whatever it is that you're right is going to be on that. Um, but that's, that's the most critical thing to think about is that the mentality, the mindset is what, is what are they charging you the door to come in? What are you going to charge when you're running your own workshop? When you're, you can do whatever you want. If you want to run your own dance, Christopher, you could run that dance and charge $10 at the door. Some people might grumble, but ultimately they'll choose to be there or they won't. And if they want you bad enough, they'll pay that $10, and that's it. The discussion is over. And if they don't want to be there, then if money was the only thing separating, then you need a different product because otherwise you're not, you're not attracting enough to get them in the door there. Um, anything on that? No. no, okay. So he already talked a little bit about record keeping and mileage logs. We talked about that. Make sure you keep good mileage logs. This is for the tax reporting side of things. And keep good records. I, too, have been audited by the IRS. I had a more pleasant experience, thankfully. But, but they came to my house. I could not go to their office. They had to come to my house to do the audit. Why? Because part of my, my, my tax deduction was a business use of office space in my home. They got to verify. In fact, you do have an office in your home. And you better have an office in your home that's not used for anything else. And I, exclusively, exclusively with that. And by the way, I passed the audit. There were no adjustments. Everything was fine. But they asked for all the records for everything. I had to produce a whole stack of documents for them. She was very nice. We spent two hours going through everything and was fine. So I'm not afraid of getting audited by the IRS. I've been down that road. I came out clean because I have clean records. Record keeping is great. If you get money, just report it. This, you know, it's, it's not only legally obligated, it's the ethical thing to do. You've got to report your money coming in the door. You know? If you think you're going to put anything in your bank account and think the IRS isn't going to find it, forget it. They're going to find everything. That's what they are. They may or may not be interested if it's a few dollars, but they can find it all. So you know, just report everything. They don't, then you can sleep at night. You don't have to worry about it. And nobody's in the 50% tax bracket here anyway, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> just, just, just put it in there, and then you can deduct things against it, and you can be fine. Keep your mileage logs. Keep good mileage logs. What do you get now? 55 cents a mile for driving. And usually that exceeds, far exceeds my actual car expenses to do that. So I keep really good logs on that. Yeah, two things that come together on this mileage situation and that you uh, need to know. If you have to be audited like he and Bo I both have been, 
do not volunteer anything to them. Let them come to you and say, I want this, this, and this. Fine, okay, I understand that. On this smiling situation, this is what I found out from my CPA. He says, if you'll start off every day and you'll put at the very top EM, stand for ending mileage, underneath that put SM, starting mileage, and underneath that TMD, total miles driven, and then show what you would what you did, left my home in Chattanooga, traveled to Knoxville, called a dance, returned. It tells what the miles are because don't, just like Eric said, they will check you and know exactly. That's a quick way that to record your mileage. If you do anything from a CPA standpoint with record keeping, he suggested to do it like this. You're welcome to walk up here later on, and it outlines how to pull your expenses out and categorize them, okay? So it makes it easier for the CPA and everybody to, to do it. So what he's talking about is actual specific mileage. That You can do that method. It's a very good method. I have a different, different method for tracking miles. I make sure I know where the dance is, and I log it, the dance. And then periodically I go into MapQuest, and I punch in my address, and I punch in the address of the dance, and MapQuest will tell me it's 129.2 miles, and I write that down as my mileage because that's I probably drove that road to get, road to get there anyway. right? So now I've got the exact thing. The IRS is fine with that. They don't care because they can see that you know, on MapQuest that you went address to address, and that's where you were, and you made your money on that. Um, but MapQuest is really good for getting mileage. Let me tell you, that's really, really good. Um, you know, we're coming to the close here on this whole session. I, I'm, I'm glad you all came here. I really appreciate that, and Paul appreciates that too. But we're looking at just rethinking, and I really would like to expand the conversation with more callers to say rethink the economics of square dancing. Rethink what, what the value proposition is that we give the dancers, what dancers maybe should pay if it's not in line with the other types of entertainment in their area for that particular market. You know, if your movie costs X, Where's your dance cost? Or if your ballroom dancing costs X, what does your square dance cost? Whatever it might be for your area. I'm not saying that my prices should be the same as your prices, but they should be in some kind of relative uh, comparison to the other, th other activities in your area. So that's a critical thing to think about because I still think in a lot of ways we're very much stuck in some old ways of thinking collectively as dancers and some callers too about how prices are and that it's time to move things forward because to keep thinking the way we are, we're going to price ourselves out of the real world out there. We're not going to be able to afford a hall, afford advertising, and afford callers to actually have dancing continuum. Anybody else have any further comments or any closing thoughts or anything? Mike? Another reason I thought I was in the wrong business is ballroom dance instructors get $60 an hour. And I just wanted to share that with you. <laughs> Do you have a, a minute or two for a personal financial question? Um, Don Beck from the island of Martha's Vineyard in Massachusetts. I think I mentioned before, before we moved to the island 18 years ago, I was calling four and five nights a week. And due to the economics of being on the island and my inability to get a group started, I'm down to two or three times a year. The question I have is when a club from Off Island calls me and said, emails me, can you call for us and what are you going to charge? I'm torn on what to charge. My break-even cost with no profit for me is close to what a local caller would charge and make some money on the deal. If I charge them my local price plus transportation, I'm going to put the club out of business or they're not going to hire me. So my current thing, why I'm down to just, I, I wouldn't want to do more than one every couple months anyway because it's, it's, you know, it's an all-day thing traveling. But trying to figure out what to charge relative to the local rates. If I charge, I typically charge what a local caller to them would charge assuming it's, you know, within a three-hour drive after I get off the 45-minute ferry. Because I want to keep my finger in it, and I enjoy it, and I want them to be able to have a good dance and enjoy it at the local rates. But I'm not, not making money and close to losing money when I do that. But I can't justify charging them what it costs me 
competing against a local caller because it's just not fair to the club. And I don't know where the balance of, of what to do on that is. Any brainstorming ideas, pros, cons? Typically, I've been charging 150 bucks now, which is on the high scale of what the local callers are getting. But I stay within the, the high range, you know, within their range. But it's, you know, the ferry to take my car over, and I can go on a cross without the car, but lugging a, a yak stack ain't no fun um, on the ferry. And the ferry for the car, depending on whether it's during the summer or the winter, is anywhere to from sixty bucks to ninety bucks. Um, you know, it, for for just me and currently we happen to have a car on the other side that we've been leaving because of stuff for my son. But just a passenger, it's four bucks each way. But when you're taking your equipment, it's it's pricey. And you know, just think what any of you what what. Um, what would you do if a club you said, "Well, I've got to tack on a minimum of a hundred bucks more just so I can come," and you've got the expense, the time expense of fifteen minutes to the ferry, half an hour waiting to get on the ferry, forty-five minute dr on trip on the ferry, and then probably an extra half hour to an hour to get to the closer local clubs, driving on the other side. I did, and I love it. <laughs> this is only a suggestion or a thought to you. Do you have local callers that you know that are on the out that not off the island that are close by that you could go do that dance, stay overnight, do another dance at another fifty miles away, and then come back home? Now you've got your calls for you, taking care of it. Okay, but do, is there another place close by that you can also work with that would give you a dance? Do some pushing and advertise. Yeah, this is what I do. If I'm going to Memphis, I'll be I'll get one in Nashville and do Memphis, and then I'll come back home. Or I might swing around and do three dances at home and come back. And just tell them why. Just say, hey, I, I need to spread some cost here. Would you help me out? And the local callers, as a rule, will get together and say, yeah, we'll put our two clubs together one night and come on in. You know, there it is. Yeah, it's, it's a tough one for you, Dom, because you have to balance the, the, what your time is worth to you versus the desire to keep to keep on top of, to keep in, in the game of score dancing. In your case, because of your location, you're probably going to be an economically – negative venture for for a while doing something like that. So it's going to probably end up being that way. So my only suggestion, the only thing I can think of is when I would contract with those clubs and they ask you your price, you'd say, listen, here's what I normally charge. Here's what my expenses are. Adds up to X. How does that work with your budget? Can you do that? And hopefully if they're a nice club, they say, we can't do that, but maybe we could do this. to help. And then you, maybe you can find a strike a compromise, you know, to what it might be. So that would be my only thought. Yeah. 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 So you, you, the idea is to say, well, I need to charge this, but I'm willing to negotiate. What can you guys do if you know they can't do that? So that, that's about all I can think of for that. Great. <laughs> All right, and that's a metropolitan. Well, you're off of you're off of Cape Cod, right? Five miles. How close is that to a metropolitan? How close is that to Boston or something? Okay, but still not a rural area. Still not. Still not a rural area, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. Right. Hmm. Right, so Tech Squares lets the kids take the phys ed course for, for credit, right? And they, they do a course every semester, so. Right, right. So they get a lot of people in that are looking at how can I get easy credit while that's happening? Right. And then they get to meet with you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's all I have. Do you have any other closing remarks, Paul? Thank you all for coming out this afternoon, and enjoy the rest of the Colorado Convention.